I enjoy coming to work every day knowing that clients are depending on me to guide them through uh, whatever financial needs they have. Every client we have is, is different. And so it's really about finding out what's really the most important thing per client. With financial planning, everything is interconnected. So a comprehensive plan means that you're taking care of income needs now, income needs in the intermediate term, and income needs long term. We'll do an asset cycle portfolio. We'll do a risk alized test. We'll do a life insurance audit or a life insurance review. And, and so when we build a deep relationship with our clients, then we can take a step back and then we can look at different options to help them specifically get to their goals. One of the things I feel our job is as advisors is to introduce strategies to clients that maybe they did not know that they were out there. But it's our idea, to, our, our job to come out and say, have you ever thought about this? And the planning is, it's not always about income, but a lot of it is also about the legacy. So the, the element of family is very important to us and it's important to our clients. Hello, this is Financially Speaking. I'm your host, Jeff Bush, and we're here on the PCTV Network uh, taping today's show uh, on women and investing. And I'm joined today by uh, my colleague, Shannon LaRosse, and who better to bring on the show to, to lend expertise on women and investing than, than Shannon. So hello, Shannon, and welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff, thank you. So today, it's going to be uh, an exciting show, uh, believe it or not. And we were just talking uh, before we started to roll the camera that uh, we've been doing this show now for 11 years. So as we, as we begin the year, we're going to talk about this very important topic, and that is women and investing. And the reason why we want to talk about that today is because so many of our viewers are women, and a lot of the feedback that we get from the show is from women and some of the unique problems uh, that they face uh, in the financial world. Mm -hmm. uh, so Shannon, uh, let's start off by just talking a little bit about some of the things that you've seen uh, in, in your practice over the years, some of the, some of the unique challenges that women are facing. Sure. Um, some of the challenges that are specific to women in investing, uh, first and foremost, there is still a gender pay gap. Um, on average, women earn only 80 cents on the dollar, uh, uh, you know, compared to what men make. So obviously, it means that they have uh, fewer funds to save, um, and that's that's due to a couple of factors. Um, we are most likely the primary caregivers for children uh, early in our lives, so typically our careers are shorter than men. So we not only are receiving less in income, but over a shorter period of time. Um, and then later in our lives, we are more likely to be the primary caregivers for parents or other family members, You know, whether it's ending a career early or taking some sort of sabbatical to care for someone. Um, only about a third of caregivers are men, two thirds are women, so we're more apt to take more time off of work. Uh, and then additionally, during our saving years, women tend to be more conservative investors than men. Um, I've seen statistics that reflect that, but I've also seen that in my own practice. Um, I like to discuss with both of my clients, um, men and women, what their risk tolerance is. Um, you know, not just as a whole, but individuals. And from what I found is typically women want to take less risk than men, meaning that over a long time period, usually we're not growing our money at as high a rate as men. Yeah. Why do you think that is, Shannon? Why do you think that uh, women as a whole are most, and you're talking about investment risk now. Investment risk, correct. Well, why, why do you think that is, that women are taking less market risk? 
I think that we tend to uh, be a little bit more overall, uh, I don't want to say pessimistic, but we don't have as much confidence in investing. Uh, some of that, I think, stems from uh, it being typical that, especially in past generations, the man was the one who would pay the bills, would manage the finances. Make the decisions. Maybe make the decisions, yeah, yeah. yeah, more comfortable, more experienced in it, so that when women are left behind, you know, as, as widowers or divorcees, they're not as familiar with investing, with savings, uh, with expenses yeah. or what they are. I think a lot of it is, and you're really good at this, is, you know, an education process. I think a lot of it, you know, we, and of course we have tools um, at our firm, you know, we have a, a, a tool called Riskalyze, which, you know, measures uh, one's tolerance for risk, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is just education and understand. I think if 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 the level of understanding is better, then you know, then we can talk more about you know being investing in certain stocks if we have the right timeline. And, mm -hmm. and I think some of those some of those tools that we have, maybe we should talk about that. Um, I know the one the one tool that we use uh, at our firm that I think is a good way to, I guess, incorporate risk into uh, a plan is, the, is our asset cycle portfolio mm -hmm. system. Because, they, and maybe we should talk about that for, sure. for a minute, uh, because there, there we, have the, we have a timeline established, and I think there if we have, you know, if we have a level of understanding of where, where we're taking market risk in the, in the mm -hmm. portfolio, maybe, you know, we can, develop more of a tolerance for risk. Certainly, I think a lot of it has to do with planning, which just to bring it back to the education process, um, I think that it's it's essential, the first and foremost, that you are educated in the areas of planning, um, how to create a plan, or you're working with someone who is. So in the asset cycle, uh, as Jeff said, uh, it focuses on different purposes rather than just looking at your whole portfolio and asking the question of, okay, how do you feel if this would decline by 10%, 20%? That's very simple. Um, especially in retirement years when it's a lot more complex, now you want to assign a job description or purpose to each of your accounts. So even though you may be a conservative investor, you don't want to take too much risk if you are more informed as to the purpose of each of your accounts, you may be more inclined to take risk on your long-term money, knowing that, well, statistically, these investments, if, if I don't need them over 15, 20 years, they've always been at a positive, maybe a tremendous positive, then you might feel more comfortable being able to take that risk, having the possibility of growing that money because it's long-term. If you have your short-term needs, taken care of. Yeah. I mean, I think it's 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 a case where like if you're taking stock risk and you, and you have a 15-year timeline, um, your your chances of of getting very good results are much greater than if you've got like a 3 to 5 year timeline. Correct. So I think if we and of course we you know, we have numbers to, you know, to bear that out. So um, I think the 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 concepts that were we're talking about today. I think what we want to do is is uh, allow our, our viewers to get more information if they want to. So we're going to put uh, some information on how to contact us up on the screen, either by email or by uh, or by phone. So let's talk about uh, some of the uh, in the news uh, items that we have. So. Uh, our firm has been featured uh, in various publications over the last year or so, and we have them up on the screen. We've been in the U.S. News World and Report, the USA Today. I know, uh, Shannon, you've been interviewed, I believe, in, was it Advisors Magazine that you were interviewed in, Market Watch? Oh, uh, uh, Proactive Advisor Magazine. Proactive um, Advisor Magazine. U.S. News and World Report. Yeah, U.S. News and World Report, Kiplinger, KYW, you can see them all up on the screen. And we have all these up uh, on our website if you want to get more information. And, of course, uh, we do this show every, uh, every month on uh, PCTV. Uh, and, the show, and the reason why uh, we, we do this show 
it not only is it shown here on like local cable right here in Pottstown, but we're also able to stream it on our website and it's also streamed on uh, the PCTV website. So even if you don't live in the general area, you can watch the show from anywhere. How about that? It's like, a, it's like another streaming service, right? It's like Netflix. Uh, anyway, so Shannon, let's get back to some of the saving challenges. Um, you, you talked about uh, a shorter average working career. And you know, what's, what's challenging, I think, for um, this generation, and particularly women, is you know this is truly the sandwich generation where uh, mm -hmm. you know you're you're raising children and you're also caring for aging parents at the same time. So that really uh, presents some special challenges. It does, um, and as I said before, a third of all caregivers are men, and that's that's actually quite a bit higher than it's been in recent past. Things are changing. Yeah. Um, the uh, gender roles are are now becoming more equal. We're not there yet, um, but the generation that's getting ready to retire, uh, less than a third of men in that generation were caregivers. So the majority of women had really stunted careers, um, you know, whether it was raising children or now caring for parents. Yeah, there are different challenges, and of course, is. What I've seen over, over the course of my career and what I've always encouraged the, uh, the couples that I work with is, is that they both are involved. Like a lot of times we'll have meetings set up and only the man will be mm -hmm. in the meeting. Right? And I'm like, where's, where's Mrs.? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, she doesn't get, she lets me do all this. She doesn't want to get involved. She doesn't, she doesn't take an interest. Mm -hmm. And I always encourage um, both parties to be involved and, and engaged in the decision making mm -hmm. because it, it, it becomes more difficult, especially if something happens to the, to the man and he's no longer with us, then it's then, you know, like we, we, we got to do a lot of backtracking. We've right. got to do a lot of education. So it's, it's much better if we can, if everybody can be engaged up front. Um, but then, you know, then you have, you have single women too mm -hmm. that, you know, whether it's they're, they're never married or they're divorced or they're mm -hmm. widowed, uh, what are some of the challenges that they face? Right. So, um, as you said, uh, you, it's, we always encourage both spouses to attend if they're married. Um, and I also have a lot of people, typically men that will say, oh, my wife's not interested in this stuff. She lets me handle it. But statistically women live six years longer than men uh, average life expectancy for a woman now according to a 2022 harvard study is uh, women age 80 and men 74. now that six year That's at age birth. difference at That's birth the, at correct birth. at okay. birth yep yep okay. so if you're if you're in your 60s now and then and you know still living then your life expectancy is beyond that okay. but correct at birth um, and then that gap that six year age gap um, and life expectancy is increasing every year. So because of that, it's a lot more likely that the wife will become a widow than it is that the husband be a widower. So the worst time for someone to have to learn how to manage finances is when they're also managing life without their spouse. So even if it's something where finances are boring to you, they don't interest you, I would encourage you to make an effort just to at least sit in, um, try to be involved in the decision making. Um, maybe even you know seek out somebody on your own. Maybe you, whoever you are getting financial advice from, seek a second opinion. Find somebody that is able to speak to your best interest and address your priorities. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's a a good point, Shannon, because so so often you know the the husband dies and we, you know, we're seeing the wife for the, you know, the very first time or maybe we've met one or two other times. It, it, becomes, it becomes an education process where we, you know, we have to, and, and you're, you bring up a good point. You're faced with all these, these to sit, you're grieving, you're, you're trying to you know, get on with your life and then you got all these financial decisions to make too. 
and mm -hmm. and a lot of them are you know they're they're you have to yeah there are, there's a sense of urgency right mm -hmm. so so just one example here in the state of Pennsylvania you have to file a, an inheritance tax return nine year, nine nine months mm -hmm. after uh, the date of death right so there yeah. that you know that um, there's no delaying that. Um, and then what, let's talk about IRAs for a minute uh, because mm -hmm. that's important. Um, how, do, how, how about um, the required minimum distributions on IRAs? How does that work? So uh, under current law, uh, it is constantly changing, especially recently. Current age, uh, 73. So the year in which you turn 73, you will have to take your first RMD, which stands for Required Minimum Distribution. Uh, it's something that's dictated by the IRS, and it is always going to be a percentage of your prior year-end balance of any tax-deferred accounts. So, or simply put, whatever your IRAs, 401ks were valued at December 31st of the prior year, you take a percentage of that. Uh, the IRS dictates the percentage, and every year as you age, that percentage increases so that over time you're taking more and more from your accounts. Uh, what becomes complicated is if there is an age difference in the husband and the wife. So let's say the husband is older and he's been taking his RMDs and he passes away. Well, now the wife inherits his IRAs in her own name, but it's not as simple as now taking them based on, on her age. What if she's only 70? Well, now you have to factor in, okay, well, what age was her husband? Did he take them before he passed? How is she going to do it? It's, it's a complicated equation, a complicated situation. Yeah, and the, and, and the IRS has rather complicated rules on this, but basically if you're inheriting an IRA where the spouse has taken minimum distributions, then you're going to at least have to take a minimum distribution uh, in the year that the spouse died, right? So let's let's so we're gonna we're gonna kill we're gonna kill off the husband first, right? Because that's what happens uh, on average typically. six years typically, typically, right? So if the the husband dies, let's say the husband dies in April, and he hasn't taken his required minimum distribution yet, well, that means that the wife is gonna have to take it for him Correct. before the end of the year, right? And if if she doesn't then there could be a penalty. Steep penalty. Steep penalty. Correct. Right. So this stuff gets, you know, gets a little gets a little complicated. And of course, the, the, the more investments you have and the more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, complicated investments you have, the more complicated the, the, the planning gets. So we're here today just to kind of lay some of this stuff out there and make it a little bit easier to understand and maybe also offer, a, offer us as a resource, if, so if you're interested in, let's say you want a second opinion, or you, or you want to sit down with an advisor just for a consultation, we'll, we always offer that free of, of, uh, free of charge. So if you're interested in a, a free consultation, either with Shannon or, or me or someone else on our team, uh, we'll put our information up on the screen, and you know, we can go over in some more detail uh, what we're talking about today. So, um, all right, very good. Now, what are some of the challenges, Shannon? One, one, one thing that, that, you know, that I see here is that women have one-third the amount saved for retirement as men. That sounds like that's a challenge right there. It's a huge challenge. Um, so now, because we have a third saved of what our male counterparts do, uh, due to many things, the, the wage gap we talked about, maybe shorter careers, what have you, uh, the truth is it winds up being a third of what men have. Yeah. And now what we have for retirement now needs to last us longer, typically, than it does men. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a great, it's not it's a great not, formula. It's not. And then you throw in the likelihood that we will require long-term care uh, way more than men. Um, all you have to do to see that in action is, is visit any sort of assisted living facility. The majority of the residents are women. Um, it's just uh, statistically we're more likely to require long-term care and we spend far more time in long-term care than men. On average, a year and a half longer than men. So we've got fewer funds for retirement. Uh, we're going to need them to last longer. Oh, in the last couple years of our life, statistically, we're going to be paying out a pretty penny for care. Yeah. 
Yeah, it really is something that, and, and I think too, um, what's important for for everybody, not just women, but I think it's important to be proactive in doing some of this planning. So, for example, um, I found that uh, Americans in general don't have enough money saved for retirement. So yes. we can we can break it down and say women have only a third amount as men, but I think we can safely say that Americans in general just don't have enough to save for retirement. Mm -hmm. So one of the solutions I, I found is take advantage of your what your employer uh, has to offer. Right. So if your employer has a 401k plan, um, you should you should contribute to that. The mm -hmm. money comes right out of your paycheck, and oftentimes uh, there's some kind of matching program, which I call that free money, right? It's a, yes. So if you're if you're putting in, let's say you're putting in three percent of your salary, and your employer's matching that three percent, well, that three percent that's a that's free money that you're getting. So you want to take advantage of that. Um, okay. So let's talk about long-term care. Um, what are some of the what are some of the pitfalls that that we're facing from a planning perspective for for women when it comes to long term care? Sure. Uh, compared to the amount of women specifically that will require long term care, there is an incredibly disproportionate percentage of people that have any sort of long term care insurance. Um, long term care insurance years ago was provided in just one way: you would pay monthly. Uh, sometimes a large amount annually, but you would pay for as long as you live. And if you required long-term care, then you meet certain criteria and this insurance would pay out and provide some of that cost. Um, however, if you are one to pass away and you never need long-term care, everything that you have paid in your whole life or however long you've been paying it, you never use. It's just kind of lost money. Um, now, those types of policies now, uh, to obtain them, are incredibly expensive. Um, but over the years, last several years especially, there have become more and more ways to insure against a need for long-term care and assure, insure against it just wiping out your assets. Um, there are other ways to insure yourself, but I feel like most people still are unaware of them. They, what would be a good example of that, Shannon, but, uh, to, to cover the risk of long-term care without actually buying long-term care insurance? Sure. Um, most popular would be to obtain life insurance. Um, now, of course, traditionally you think of life insurance just providing a death benefit to your, uh, your heirs, your beneficiaries. But there are other uses for cash value life insurance. There are many ways to pay, whether on a monthly or annual basis, or sometimes just one time. Um, and it would provide, similarly, a long-term care benefit. A lot of them are a lot more flexible than the pay-as-you-go, um, meaning that they would also pay if you choose to have in-home care as opposed to living in a facility. So how does that how does that work then? So if you what happens if you you purchase a life insurance policy? And, and you get sick, you're, 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 in, you're now in long-term care. How, how mm -hmm. does that work? Um, every policy is a bit different. Most popular though is if you are unable to complete two of the ADLs or activities of daily living, which are the criteria to determine whether or not you require long-term care, then the life insurance policy would allow you to access a very large portion of the death benefit. Um, and they would allow you to access that to pay for whatever type of care you require or you choose. So, you're, so in essence, the insurance company is prepaying the death benefit. They are. They're prepaying the death benefit. And then unlike the pay-as-you-go policies in the past, if you don't require long-term care, then your beneficiary receives the entire death benefit once you pass. Tax-free. So, tax-free. Completely yeah. tax-free. Yeah, so I think, and I, and I think, um, my experience has been that with, in, with respect to insurance, I think people tend to not want to have the long-term care insurance because the, the, one of the common objectives that I've, that I've gotten is, well, what happens if we pay all these premiums over the years and we never get sick and mm -hmm. we never use it? Well, it's just like any other insurance. It's like you have homeowner's insurance and mm -hmm. if your house doesn't burn down, then, you know, you, you, that, that's money that you didn't that you didn't use. So with life insurance, though, 
it's, it's, it's a pretty good, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to die. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> at some point. So if you don't use the insurance for long-term care, then it reverts to uh, a, ben a benefit, a tax-free death benefit. So that's a pretty, that's a mm -hmm. pretty strong, uh, that's a pretty strong reason to, uh, you know, to get the, to get the insurance, get the, the life insurance. Certainly. And the carriers now have gotten pretty innovative with, uh, with these, with these life insurance plans. And you can, you know, you can get a pretty significant part of the, uh, of the, of the death benefit paid in the form of a, of a long-term care benefit. Correct. Uh, there are countless versions of long-term care coverage provided by insurance companies. Um, you can really structure it dependent on what your preferences are, what your unique needs are. Uh, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, you know, there are a lot of options. Shannon, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the solutions because I think, you know, we've, we've spent a fair amount of time today talking about what some of the what some of the problems are, uh, but what what are some of the things that uh, women can do to become a little more proactive and and try to you know stay ahead of of some of these challenges that they're facing? Yeah, um, one of the buzzwords that we hear a lot lately, especially as women, is self care. You want to provide self care. You want to make sure you're getting enough sleep. Um, you're taking care of yourself physically, getting exercise, eating well, um, but your financial health is also incredibly important. So one of the elements of self-care is to prioritize your financial life. Um, number one, by paying yourself first. This is something that I heard growing up all the time. Yeah. Pay yourself first. I like it. Yep. In your budget, um, when you're thinking about things that you need to pay, rent, mortgage, car insurance, all of that just as essential as paying all of those is to contribute to savings, uh, retirement savings, emergency savings. Um, so prioritize yourself. Um, we as women tend to prioritize our families. Uh, we sacrifice for our children, and not that men don't either. Um, I, I know that they do. We just tend to uh, do it maybe a little bit more so, maybe too much. So it's really important that we prioritize ourselves too, because if we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't take care of those around us. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's a balancing act. It's absolutely a balancing act. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a budgeting act, uh, which leads me to the, the next point. Uh, education and finance. You don't necessarily need to study stocks and bonds and you don't need to be able to trade in the market. You know, you, you can find someone for that. Uh, what I mean is to first and foremost have an understanding of your own finances. You know, what type of money you or your family is bringing in, what your expenses are, and maybe where you have wiggle room that you could save a bit more. Um, but really being educated in what it means to save what your needs might be. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, we talked about this earlier, but I think the, these um, 401k plans or the, these employer-sponsored uh, plans are really important because if you look at how wealth is built uh, in this country, t at least today, um, most of it is most of it's done through the 401k. I mean, Correct. most most millionaires, no, most mm -hmm. new millionaires are built through the 401k. That's correct. Yeah. So so if you do have a 401k, make sure you're contributing at least up to the match, but don't just stop at the match. Yeah. Increase it. Have a plan to increase it over time. Yeah, and I think you know you said pay yourself first. That's essentially what you're doing when the money's coming out of your paycheck because you don't even mm -hmm. you don't even see, don't see it. it it becomes mm -hmm. part of the it becomes part of the plan so i think right. that's i think that's good advice but if you don't have access to a 401k you know either uh you you don't have a typical um you know job for a company that offers one or maybe you're unemployed at the moment there are other ways to save whether it's a traditional ira a roth ira or whether it's just an after-tax account if you don't have access to a 401k, there are so many other options for you. Um, I think that is, that'll lead me to my final uh, advice, and that's to seek out someone who is a trusted professional. Uh, do that by interviewing several people. Um, no one advisor is going to be right for everyone. 
uh, even us, <laughs> um, you, know, the, you, you have to be a fit with your advisor. They have to speak in a way that you understand. They have to prioritize your needs and what you want out of investing and out of retirement. Yeah, that's, that's good advice, Shannon, and I think um, it, it, it would be good to, you know, whether, whether you want to contact our, our firm and, you know, we'd be happy to sit down and, and offer an opinion, but, or maybe you want to get a second opinion, but I think it's good to, and, we're, and I think we just scratched the surface today. I mean, there's so much more that, that uh, is out there in terms of, of, of education and things that you, you know, that you can do to, to improve your financial situation. So with all that being said, we're going to put a wrap on today's show. Shannon, thank you for joining me today. It was a, I think it was a good show, a very worthwhile show for our, for our viewers. And we're going to be signing off. This is Financially Speaking.